So, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Urban Land Institute Central Florida District Council signature event. Uh, we're very happy to be here in Brevard today for the Brevard County updates, uh, airways, waterways, and parkways. Uh, I'm Greg Witherspoon. I am lucky enough to serve as the Central Florida District Council Chair for another year or so. Um, it's a pleasure to be in this position. I see a lot of new faces out there, so in brief, I'm just gonna say, if you don't know much about ULI, I encourage you to take a look. Uh, we have over 37,000 members worldwide, and here in Central Florida alone, uh, we have over 300 members currently, and we're growing. Got a lot of exciting events coming up, just like the one you see here. I may have an opportunity later to mention a few more of them. But uh, it's my job to be very brief, because we have great panelists today, so uh, basically I'm just gonna do my job and mention our uh, sponsors. And so uh, I'd like to thank our annual sponsor, Canaan Associates. Uh, our gold annual sponsors are Ackerman, uh, GDC Properties, Kimley Horn, Lounge, Drostick, Doster, Cantor, and Reed. Uh, our silver annual sponsors are Crescent Community, uh, DPR Construction, Emerson International, GAI Consultants, HDR Engineering, Land Advisors Organization and Land Advisors Capital, uh, Little John Engineering, Mawson Associates, PCL Construction, RCL Co, Usler Development, VHB, and Walt Disney Imagineering. I'd also like to give a special thanks today for today's event. Uh, our presenting sponsor is Dean Mead. Uh, they've worked very hard to put this all together, so thank you all for your very hard work. Uh, and our patron sponsor is, is Lassiter Transportation Group. I saw Sands in the, office, in the uh, audience a little while ago. Thank you, Sands. And our contributing sponsor is the Vieira Company. Uh, always a pleasure to be working with the Vieira Company. And our friend sponsor is PSI. And Florida Space Coast EDC is our in-kind partner. And they also help with a lot of the organization for this event. So if we could give everybody a quick round of applause for our sponsor. So with that said, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Laura Minton Young. She's a real estate attorney with the Vieira office of Dean Mead. She's going to uh, get the ball rolling for us. As I mentioned, we've got a great program. We want to jump right into it. Uh, Laura's been practicing law for 12 years. She represents individuals, businesses, banks, and various aspects of commercial real estate and real estate financing, including development, acquisition, sales, leasing, lending, workouts, land use, growth management, and agribusiness. Anything you can need in the development world. So, welcome Laura, and let's kick the program off. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. I too will be very brief. Um, good afternoon, thank you all for coming. Our firm is honored to partner with the ULI and sponsor today's program. With our roots firmly planted in Brevard since 1989, there has been no time more exciting than now as we focus on the economic vitality and growth here in Brevard County. DMEAT is a full service business law firm with over 50 attorneys in six different offices. We have our office here in Brevard and Vieira our um, main offices in Orlando, we have the Fort Pierce office, Tallahassee office, Gainesville, as well as Tampa. We're a collaborative group of professionals who have a good, have good fortune to be working with many of the premier organizations in the county, including the Florida Institute of Technology, the Vieira Company, VRPH, Otto Beckner Robeson, and the EDC of Florida Space Coast, to name a few. I'd like to recognize all of our um, elected officials who are here today, we have several. We have Honorable Jim Barfield, Chairman of the Brevard uh, County Board of County Commissioners. I believe Honorable Kurt Smith, is he in attendance? He's also with Brevard County Board of County Commissioners. Honorable Wayne Justice, Fort Canaveral Port Authority Commission. Honorable Stephanie Ely, the City of West Melbourne City Council. Honorable Debbie Thomas, City of Melbourne City Council, Honorable Jim Tully, City of Titusville Mayor, and Honorable Andrea Young, City of West Melbourne uh, City Council. Let's give them all a hand. <laughs> if there are any that I, any elected officials that I forgot, could you please stand? Did I forget anybody? No one's standing, so I can't. <laughs> um, and now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Anna Long. She is one of our uh, of council attorneys in the Orlando Real Estate Department, and she's going to be the moderator for our first panel today. Thank you. Good 
Good afternoon and welcome. As Laura said, my name is Anna Long. I am of counsel in the Orlando office of Deed Mead and very, very pleased to be there and here this evening with you all. My areas of practice include land use, environmental law, and most recently and certainly most exciting is the regulation and permitting of drones. Ooh. Ah. I would like to tell you a little bit of how this is going to work today so that you're prepared. Um, we're going to have two panels. So the first thing I'd ask you to do is if you have your phones or any other electronic devices, you know the drill, could you please put it on silence? Thank you so much. The second thing is you all were given blue folders, and in your blue folders you'll find a pink evaluation sheet. Those really do help for this program and future programs, figuring out what we did well and what we can do better. I'm going to each, uh, introduce each of our panelists up here today with a brief bio. Their full bios, as well as those of the panelists on their second panel, can also be found in your blue folder. And then we'll begin with each of our panelists giving an overview of their respective organizations. And then we'll head back to them with some questions from the podium. And lastly, questions from all of you in the audience. We'll remove ourselves from the panel and bring up our second panel that is not intermission. Okay. Popcorn will not be served, so please stay seated so we can stay on time, and that, that way we can all enjoy the beverages afterwards, okay? So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Our first panelist to my far right is Dave Purley. Dave is the director of the capital improvement for the Orlando Melbourne International Airport. Prior to accepting his current position, David held key positions at A.D. Morgan Corporation, H. J. High and Port Canaveral. Dave has over three decades of construction experience with projects ranging from retail to hotels, jails, government, and educational entities. Please join me in welcoming Dave Purley. Our next panelist is Russell Rusty Roberts, who is currently the Vice President of Government Affairs for All Aboard Florida. Rusty is responsible for engaging numerous stakeholders involved in all of Florida, including local, state, and federal agencies. Rusty has over 30 years of experience in legislative and political management. He served as the Chief Staff for, Cong excuse me, for Congressman John Micah, and in addition, in his private experience, private sector experience included serving as a federal lobbyist for Miami-Dade County and as the Public Affairs Director for Capital Bank. Let's welcome Rusty. Our third panelist is Dr. Ken Stockpool, who currently serves as the Vice President for External Relationships and Economic Development at the Florida Institute of Technology. Dr. Stockpool has held various positions during his eight-year tenure with the university, including serving as Dean of the College's Aeronautics and Vice President for the Aviations Program. Dr. Stockpool earned his PhD in Public Affairs from UCF. And, made, and received his bachelor's and master's degree from Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ken Stockpole. <laughs> Rounding out our illustrious panel is Linda Weatherman. And while most of you know Linda, and she probably doesn't even need an introduction, let's give her one anyway. Linda is the president and CEO of the Economic Development Commission of Florida's Space Coast. A native Floridian, Linda has served as the president and CEO of the EDC for, since 1994. She is responsible for the attraction of new business and investment, as well as the retention and existing of industries throughout the Space Coast. Please welcome Linda Weatherman. All right, well, let's get right to it. Dave, you're up. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just real quick, um, I've only been with the airport for uh, six weeks, so please forgive me. I may have to refer to my notes here. Um, but if you do have any questions, I can certainly help Wayne Justice on the uh, board side when we get to that phase of the uh, panel discussion. Uh, I learned... Can you hear me now? How about now? It's green. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. 
Well, when I got started at the uh, airport in my first week, uh, Greg Donovan, our executive director, uh, introduced me to a new term, and it is called voluntold, because I've been voluntold to be here today. Uh, to give you a little briefing of, of what's going on at the airport, uh, Melbourne Airport was established in 1933. During World War II, it was used as a naval air station. In 1952, we established the first commercial service with Eastern Airlines. Our current terminal that we have was built in 1990, and we received international status in 1995. Today, uh, commercial flights include Delta, American, Elite, and Porter Airlines. In 2009, Embraer opened their shop to begin assembly of uh, their uh, premier jets, the Phenom 100 and the Phenom 300. Uh, today, all of Embraer's Phenom jets are assembled at Melbourne. In 2012, uh, Embraer began expanding their facilities and, and added an engineering and technology center. And in 2015, we began, uh, began Project Summit, which is a $52 million expansion. And in that expansion, we started with a production facility. It was designed by PRPH and is being constructed by the Austin Group. It's a 116,000 square foot facility that will be completed by the end of this April. This project is going to be for the assembly of their new Legacy 500. Uh, along with production facility, we're building a new paint facility, which is a 35,000 square foot uh, building, which will be ready to use by the end of September. And then a delivery center of 26,000 square feet that will be ready in January of 2017. Some of our current projects that we have going on at the airport right now is a north side access road project, a $1.2 million road. Uh, improvement uh, being done by Lucetti Construction, designed by Airport Engineering Company. This project is expected to be complete by the end of May. Our another project we've got going on is our Taxiway K expansion. It's phase three of four phases. The current phase is $1.2 million. Uh, KCF Site Development is our contractor. AEC is doing the design and this will be completed by the end of the summer. Projects that we currently have uh, under solicitation is the 1100 Woody Burke building, which is a re-roofing project, 26,000 square foot uh, modified built up. Those bids are due at the end of this month. And then our first CM at risk project, uh, RFP is out for the Aeromod hangar. This was the old former mid-air project. Uh, this particular project is for the inclusion of a foam fire deluge system. It's into an existing 747 hangar. Uh, this is to, so that if there is an accidental fuel spill, the foam will fill up the hangar to prevent uh, flash fires within the facility. Uh, this project is challenging also because with foam system, we also have to put in a new floor system and a trench drain system, uh, and that would have to support the 747 that would be in that hangar. The projects that we just completed is a new uh, VHF uh, omnidirectional uh, radar facility a $1.5 million project that was completed by WJ. Uh, FAA is completing their work on this particular facility and will be operational by the end of April. Uh, we also have our master plan, which is currently being updated. We have the team of ESA, a EAC, and CNS uh, working on this, and its expected completion is in early 2017. The project we have under design right now is our new control tower. Currently, Melbourne has the second oldest control tower in existence, and our executive director keeps, keeps telling me he can't wait till we have a, a control tower taller than the tail of the planes that we land. Uh, this project's design will be complete in June, and construction will start sometime in September. Our next two projects uh, currently being designed by BRPH is our federal inspection station, which is for Customs and Border Protection. That project will start construction in the fall of 2016. And then our terminal transformation project, which will take our 1990s terminal and bring it up to today's standards. In that terminal transformation, we'll be doing upgrades uh, to the concourse, including a new restaurant bar area, and construction on this will start in the summer of 2017. And then uh, some of our uh, 
Current uh, tenants that we work with include uh, Northrop Grumman, FIT, Eastern Florida State College, Bear Air, Harris, and, and several others. And then uh, one quick plug, we do have an air show coming up on April 1st through the 3rd. We'll be featuring the Bretling Air Team, and this will be the first time that we'll have a nighttime air show on April 1st. Thank you very much, David. It was very interesting, and we'll hear more from David during our question and answer. Right now, we're going to go ahead and move along to Rusty. Good um, afternoon. My name is Rusty Roberts, and I work for a company called All Aboard Florida, which is part of a company called Florida East Coast Industries. And I'm really excited to be here because, especially before ULI Group, because, you know, when I think about ULI and the name Urban Land Institute, we think about, there you go, good. Uh, we think about, um, uh, I think about development. Uh, and I think about what we are doing, what our company is doing, and I think about the, 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 uh, the, the model that we are embracing in terms of developing Florida. Now, you may think this is a transportation project, uh, and it sort of is, but it really is three things. It's, first, it's the intersection of hospitality and transportation, and it is a land development project because what we're doing is doing something that railroads haven't really done in more than 100 years, is actually have a real estate component part of our business plan. Uh, and we are all about uh, urban infill, uh, especially if anybody gets to go down to Miami and see what we're doing, uh, you'll see we're talking about uh, changing the way people think about uh, they travel around Florida and changing the way people think about uh, how they live. And we also think that we are uh, capturing, uh, certainly recognizing a trend in the way people want to live, especially with the next uh, generations. And so uh, we created a product called All Aboard Florida, which we announced in March of 2012. Uh, and if you haven't heard about our project, and I don't know, maybe you don't live here, um, but uh, we, uh, we are, I put this very humbly when I say we are the um, most exciting infrastructure project going on in America today. That's kind of like a Donald Trump statement, I suppose. But, it, 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 but I, I'm very proud of what we're doing, and I want to brief, briefly explain to you what this is all about. All Aboard Florida is an express, uh, you could say high-speed rail, but it's not European-style express, intercity rail project that will take us from Orlando to um, Miami in about three hours. And uh, why did we come up with this idea? For a couple of reasons. Uh, one is we happen to own a railroad quarter. Uh, just out this door called Florida East Coast Railway. And we happen to notice that congestion is getting worse in Florida, right? If you live in Orlando, we know no matter what time of day you're on I-4, you're going to run into problems. It's certainly the same way in South Florida, and it's happening all over the state in the major population areas. So we, uh, uh, we're looking at, I have no idea what the slides say behind me, so i got to look. Um, we, have, we have an idea that uh, we have to address congestion in this Florida, in, in the state, and we have uh, a means to, to, to address that. Uh, through the Olive Oil Florida program. Uh, we have a central thesis in this project, and that is a 235-mile corridor that is, it is, it is uh, too long to drive and too short to fly. And that is the, that is the sweet spot if you look at, uh, and we did look at railroad projects around, around, uh, around the world, is what, at what point will you get out of your car? Uh, and what point will you get out of the airplane? Uh, and that is, that is a three-hour trip. If it's four hours, you might fly. If it's two hours, you might drive. Uh, it just so happens that Miami and Orlando are in that in terms of their distance, in that sweet spot to encourage people to get out of their car and maybe try a different way to travel. And so that's what we've done. But we also found that between Central and South Florida, and ready for this number, there are, we, we studied uh, research of 500 million individual trips between South Florida and Central Florida every year. Uh, within 15 or 20 minutes of our corridor, that's 100 million trips. Uh, so we have a catchment uh, a group of, of, of potential customers uh, that we could uh, persuade to ride our train, and it is not just people who live in Florida, but it's some of the 105 million people who visited the state uh, last year. And so that's what we're going to bring to Florida, uh, hopefully uh, starting next year. Um, as I say, we are reinventing train travel. When I said we're at the intersection of hospitality and transportation, that's exactly what, what we're doing. We're not building a transportation product. We're building a hospitality project uh, that, that, that Floridians will want to use to get around, that tourists will want to use, uh, not only just to get around, but see more of our state, and to enjoy it at the same time. Uh, Amtrak's a wonderful product, but we are using that as a baseline in terms of efficiency, reliability, and, and comfort. 
Uh, we launched the product, uh, even though we announced this product in March of 2012, we launched our brand name last October, uh, and we call it Brightline. The, the uh, Amtrak owns a cellar all aboard Florida. Their product is Brightline. Uh, and that is, uh, I, I like the joke that we paid somebody in New York way too much money to figure out a brand name, a color scheme, and a logo. Uh, but that's what we came up with, uh, Brightline. A uh, smarter way to travel around Florida. I have a short video, I think it's next. Today, we are all connected. Brought together to celebrate a better way to get around Florida. A smarter way. An alternative to our state's crowded roads. Transportation that will unite the state of Florida. Connecting you to the cities of Orlando, West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, and Miami like never before. Moving you seamlessly between new urban centers. Strategically located exactly where you want to be. Near more of the places you want to go through comfortable and accommodating stations. With modern trains built to deliver convenience with frequent on-time departures. Comfort with reserved seating and quality food and drink. Productivity with Wi-Fi and power to keep you working and always in touch. And speed moving effortlessly between Miami and Orlando in three hours while delivering you just steps away from local commuter trains, buses, and cabs. Moments away from endless opportunities to work and play. Florida, this is your transportation future. It's not just smart, it's Brightline. So that's our product. One thing I do want to mention, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ken, is that uh, you noticed uh, that route, uh, Miami to Orlando, uh, with stops in West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale, uh, that's what we call the trunk, the, uh, the, the beginning of a system that we hope that's going to grow. And I know we're going to get the Q&A a little bit later and we'll get into that, but I've got some really exciting news about Brevard County and I look forward to talking with you more about that. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Okay, we're going to move on. So, Dr. Ken, you ready? Yes, I am. And I think you can hear me. We've got the slides going. All right, very good. So a frequent statement, I'm all set, of our president, Anthony Catanese, that FIT is not only located in the community, it is of the community. And that's a powerful statement because as a university succeeds in contributing to the region's economic development, it becomes a relevant university, and that's what we strive to be. The communities and regions served by a relevant university will realize sustained advances in prosperity, quality of place, and become extremely attractive to entrepreneurs, innovators, businesses, investors, and highly skilled job seekers. If you can imagine an incoming freshman class of 1,000 students, you can easily imagine a class of 1,000 new scientists, engineers, or business persons, 1,000 new ideas, and perhaps 1,000 new businesses. Imagine the capability and promise of one freshman class, much less the preceding and succeeding classes that matriculate, graduate, and impact the community. So the immediate question before us is, what is FIT doing to contribute to the themes of this panel? Airways, waterways, and parkways. What is FIT's involvement on significant project, projects that contribute to the economic vitality of Brevard County? So let's start with airways. Our College of Aeronautics, which I was once the dean, uh, brings students from around the globe to become pilots, air traffic controllers, aviation safety specialists, accident investigators, human factor specialists, meteorologists, unmanned aerial vehicle operators, and more. And we're probably most well known in the industry for airport planners and managers that are running many ma major airports across this country. Our very own Greg Donovan, your boss, is the new executive director of the Orlando Melbourne International Airport is an FIT alum, so we're extremely proud of that. Our College of Engineering and Science programs are placing thousands of workers in our tremendous local aerospace and space-related workplaces. We can count 5,000 alumni working within 10 miles of FIT, probably more than 10,000 within 50 miles. Now to waterways. FIT has been a giant in the ocean and coastal space for more than 40 years graduating numerous ocean engineers and marine biologists. We recently established the Indian River Lagoon Research Institute to improve and sustain the health of the lagoon. And we are proud to say that the new Indian River Lagoon Council is headed by an FIT PhD alum, Dr. Dwayne DeFries. I think many of you know him. And we don't stop there. We're working at the port to design systems to clean and provide better anti-fouling of hulls. And in our labs, the redesign of hulls that will save 
on water drag and countless fuel expense. We're even working in the lionfish invasion issue, and I understand lately they provide a tasty meal. <laughs> and finally, the parkways. We have an economics professor called Mr. Or Dr. Slotkin that sat on the Blue Ribbon Transportation Panel to study the mismatch between dollars available and infrastructure needs, and our own President Cat Knees again, soon retiring from the presidency, will um, is certainly not finished contributing to the region. He'll ramp up his work on the Central Florida Transportation Task Force, and we're pleased to see that. So there's just a few examples of FIT's involvement on significant projects that will transform Brevard's economic landscape. We're happy to participate. We'll continue to seek ways to do more. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Linda. Okay, you can hear me okay? Is it on? Okay, we've got a quick question. How many are uh, not residents of Brevard County? If you raise your hand, give me an idea of it. Okay, so we have about 20%, 25%. Okay, <laughs> I want to make sure that some of my comments are directed. My second question, is there a present here? And I'm not trying to be funny, I just want to know. Press, if you're here, duck. <laughs> She's saying that in my job, the duck. Is there a present here? I just want to know. It's just a courtesy. I don't believe so. Okay, all right, thank oh, you. Oh, wait, I saw him. I guess, yes. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay, okay. All right, I just want to know. I just uh, want to make sure. I learned to ask that question. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, uh, first of all, thank you for having this. I think it's really great. There's so many things taking place in Brevard County. We probably could have something like this maybe twice a year to talk about. You just see what's going on with the FIT and then all aboard Florida, and of course our very own airport, and not to mention the port we're going to talk about later, so many dynamic things. I do want to talk a little bit about the EDC and what we do. Uh, some may be familiar with our organization. Every community has one. They may be within a county. They may be in uh, multi-counties. But basically, their job is to, in many ways, help design the manufacturing industrial future of the county by relocating companies coming in, assisting companies to expand, or helping companies start up that are manufactured, high-tech driven companies. And there's an economic principle behind it. I won't get into it if you ever want me to come back and explain the reason why I'm happy to, but many of you will understand that. Remember our high school economics, manufacturing are the ones that create the, have the highest um, multiplier effect. It's the bottom peer primary sector of the economy of which everything else is built upon. That's why you go after, an EDC goes after industrial manufacturing companies, not second tier companies, not second. It's a bad thing, but that's the um, companies that are retail and, and nature and stuff like that. And it's a dogfight. Uh, you can imagine what community wouldn't want a company coming in and dropping 50 jobs, 500 jobs, 1,500 jobs, paying 50, 70, 80 thousand dollars. There are communities desperate for jobs like that, and we are constantly in that fight day to day. And I hope I don't sound cranky, but that's because I've probably been up for a long, long time. But I'm going to reference something that David said. And this is for my um, partners here in Brevard County. We are very excited. I'm going to show you a map in a minute about the locations that have taken place and expansion that have taken place that EDC played a role on. And by that, I mean it's not limited. That's just the projects we had that were successful. I'd like to say very proudly that I would challenge any other community in the nation to do what's going on, it's going on in regards to relocation, in addition to everything else that's happening. But what I want to share with you and remind you is a lot of this all started, and particularly it was a psychological, I think, uh, shot in our arm because when the first of uh, the shuttle workers started getting laid off and the last bit of those came, it was happening at the same time as the biggest and deepest recession in the state of Florida, certainly in this country, at the same time. And right about that same time, not only did we announce Orion, but we also announced Embraer. And that's as David said, that was building the Phenom 100 and the 300. Following that, fast forward, we competed as a community for the engineering center, 225 jobs. Fast forward a couple more years, competed for that, and that's where the legacy 450 and 500 came in, of which we'll probably be cutting the ribbon in a couple of three months. None of those, two, that's at, if you add them up, that's about 1,000 jobs. The first Phenom 100 Project Jaguar, if you remember, don't ever, ever forget it was a 3-2 vote at this county commission. So you can never, ever think that when a EDC or someone's talking about project and you, we really need your help and support, it's not just, you know, we're saying it because we think it's cute, it's, it's critical. That the Economic Development Commission is a collection of businesses that support economic development and we can't have it any other way. So I appreciate your time being here. Um, 
the EDC does also has uh, expanded our offerings because I think a, a, a good EDC continues to focus on relocations. Uh, a smart EDC identifies problems and try to mitigate them, and a wise EDC hopefully gets to mitigate them. And the problem with identifying problems and mitigating is then you own the problem. And if you can't change it, then you're the one, you're the, from the face of, you know, oh, the shuttle, oh yeah, I remember you, you were talking about the shuttle, we didn't do anything about it. So you've got to be, you know, it's kind of dicey when you do that, but it, it's certainly the right thing to do. A lot of EDCs would not do that. Um, I'm going to show you a slide real quick. I think my, my picture was back there so much, I would have changed that. I didn't know that. I was wondering why you're sitting and listening so intently. Um, can I push this button? Do you know? To the right. Okay. I'm going to skip this one and go back to this in a minute. But basically, I'm going to go through this quick because I knew we still have to go into our questions. But this is what's going on. Really, this is the first time I've shared this collectively throughout the county. Ask my staff to put something together. You don't have the economic um, ramification numbers of that. That's something we'll be coming up with um, later. But. Um, I challenge you to think about what's going on in this nation, and then I'm going to finish with one other comment. These are companies that have relocated <coughs> or expanded, of which we played a, a project, a role on. Total job 6,000. This is from um, from 2002, so we're talking about four years. And if you think about how the community was about six years ago when we started talking about the shuttle decline, and yet we don't have the morose feeling now, it's because of this kind of things that are happening, and with my colleagues up here too. $1.2 billion. Remember the, the uh, what did we have? We had a, uh, the incentive money that we needed to build infrastructure under President Obama. We had our own little one going on here. And this is the last one too, and I'll leave you with that. I think that's the last one, yeah. Um, so that's what's going on. I did want to share that with you. I won't get into all of the details, but I'm very proud that in addition to this, the EDC also has uh, programs tied to technology. Uh, with our technology docking program, the, EDC, uh, the only EDC in the nation that has a a project with the uh, NASA headquarters and KSC, and my partners are in the crowd here helping us to really take advantage, which I felt as an EDC we've never leveraged properly, but truly take advantage of the technology capabilities and deploy those to our local companies here. So make sure that any uh, capabilities that KSC might have can benefit our partners. We have nine companies having direct uh, relations with KSC and addressing, addressing some technology challenges that they have. One final thing, if I don't mind, while well, I'm up here uh, preaching a little bit, I showed you some significant, and trust me, go back and check other places what's going on in Brevard County. It's amazing what's happening. In the legislative session this year, we're talking about putting zero in the governor's closing fund. I am not, I'm apolitical. I work with whoever gets elected. Uh, but I will tell you, I would like to tell you that if corporate relocation came because we have our lovely areas and we have beautiful beaches, then my job would be a lot easier, which I never heard the word incentives ever existed, but is practical and you need to have it. And when we have a, a state that puts zero incentives, those three shot, slides I showed you, I don't know how we're going to address it again. Other communities are doing even more incentives, or the latter will be this, the burden on the local community will be even greater. Because while we have a partnership with the state, the state will put money in if we put money in. But now the burden's going to be on the local community, so I, I, I urge you to watch that uh, and look at that uh, because it's in the industry that drives this county, which drives the rest of the economy. And one other note, in Brevard County, our share of manufacturing um, is about 16%, um, about where the state of Florida average is about 8%. So we are more of a manufacturing-driven economy than most. So, okay. Good job. Okay. Good job to all of our speakers for staying on time. Thank you. And because they stayed on time, we'll be able to entertain a lot of your questions. But let me ask a few of, of all of you to get it started. Um, we heard what you've done in the last several years to get you all where you are today. And I guess I'm interested in hearing where do you, what are the challenges that you believe your organization is going to face, let's say, in the next two to three years? So in the next two to three years, what do you see coming online? And let's go ahead and start with, with um, Rusty. <laughs> okay, excuse me. Let's start. <laughs> yeah, let's start with you, Rusty. Okay. Gosh, biggest challenge is convincing people that uh, <clears throat> private passenger rail is a viable enterprise. <laughs> uh, that's that's a big debate, and uh, you know it's a great debate actually because because our project is the first attempt in almost five decades to <laughs> to bring a to create a private. Inner city passenger rail system. Every inner, every system that you read about, Sunrail is a commuter rail, Tri-Rail in South Florida is a commuter rail. Most of the stuff 
is, uh, is, is commuter rail. A lot of inner city rail systems around the country, Amtrak runs many of them, uh, several states do, they're all public. Um, we're, we're, we're blazing a new trail. We're, I'd like to say we're rekindling Henry Flagler's dream. Uh, his last passenger train ran in 68. Um, but we're not the only one. We see a trend happening in America uh, in transportation where private sector has been investing in transportation uh, where they have not invested before, where where it's always been left up to the public sector to, to manage transportation, uh, to, to meet a transportation challenge and try and resolve that challenge. The I4 Ultimate Project is one of those public-private partnerships. Uh, we're not so much public-private, we're more, more private. There's another project going on in Texas, Dallas to Houston, that'll be all private. California to, to, to uh, Las Vegas. So it is starting to happen, and there are actually viable viable uh, projects uh, now that are that are making uh, actually making a profit that's a challenge um, and and another challenge we have is is a uh, is a fact of life with every kind of major infrastructure project anybody wants to do whether you want to put in a toll road somewhere or a new train or whatever it is you always have those that element of folks who don't want change we call them NIMBYs, not in that backyard and uh, and that that's always we always have to deal with that, and, and we are certainly not alone. Uh, we're dealing with that too. Brevard County, by the way, has been great in that respect. Great county to work with. Great leaders, people like Linda, uh, County Commission, all the city city uh, councils, uh, your transportation planning organization, wonderful to work with. So um, uh, we're we're delighted about that. Thank you, Dr. Stock. What do you see as the university's um, biggest challenges going forward? Well, thank you, and I think you can hear me. Um, as far as our economic role in the uh, region, challenges ahead is, you know, we can train uh, for, the, uh, for the workforce, we can conduct meaning, meaningful research, but we also have a role in facilitating uh, the quality of life uh, in, in the community, and, and we have to help our businesses grow. And the entrepreneurship programs that we provide in our College of Business um, and our Women's Business Center that was recently rebranded to We Venture reaches into the Orlando market also in, in helping women's business and men's business, businesses grow. And that's important. Our Florida Tech Research Park is, uh, is uh, in, con in uh, cooperation with the airport and with the city is a challenge to help uh, the EDC attract uh, business to, to the area. We just started a center for advanced manufacturing and innovative design. And that's going to be a big help to the local businesses for, for the entrepreneurship in that area and life cycle management. So there are some challenge, challenges ahead. But the biggest challenge our new president is, is going to have is just developing a plan to grow our reputation nationally and internationally and improve our academics. <laughs> And Linda, you mentioned incentives, but other than that, what's another challenge you see is facing the EDC? Yeah, let me show you one, and it's really facing uh, a lot of communities, uh, and I'm going to talk about this for a little bit, I'm going to try to go backwards on this. Okay, this one right here. This is a slide that should keep everybody in economic development awake, and, and in the workforce too. Uh, what I'm showing you is the, the people that are employed and their ages in manufacturing. And you can see, in, and we've done wonderfully and wildly successful in manufacturing relocation, okay? The bad good news is that this is systemic with the country. We're not the only, this is not, we're not unusual. In fact, if you place this over the same uh, bar chart with the state of Florida, it'd be very similar to it too. But what we're facing is in the next maybe 10, 15 years, we're gonna lose basically our, our competitive advantage in our workforce. Why were we so successful? Why did Avriere look here? Why was Orion interested here? Because we did have that legacy of having a workforce, understanding working for military specs and everything like that. So I will tell you that, you know, in this country, we've lost a generation of people going into manufacturing. Uh, all of us grew up, our parents probably wanted us to be white collar workers and not going into manufacturing, but it's changed now. We're talking about, Ken talked about the advanced manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing has changed. Um, we actually have double challenge because not only is it, are we lacking people going into manufacturing, but the demands and skills necessary for those people in manufacturing are higher than they ever were before. The EDC has started a small pilot program, um, and all it's attempting to do is two-prong approach. Number one is, how do we get someone interested in going into manufacturing? And as I told my board of directors, why don't we take a playbook from the U.S. Army in the 1970s and 80s, when you know, nobody in the 70s wasn't too sure of going into the Army, 
But what do they do? All you can be. We're going to train you. Be the best you can be. It's good. It's sexy. It's no, what's good for the country. Every one of those things you can say about manufacturing. And I'm convinced we can get people that might not, I don't, if you want to go to college, that's great. But if you're getting out of high school, you just came back from uh, two or four years in the, in the Army, and you're thinking, what am I going to do? Um, if we can open the door for manufacturing, and once you get someone who says, well, gosh, okay, I think I'm interested in manufacturing, what do I do? You've got to immediately close the deal. And I don't think, and I don't think it's very prudent if you go to someone and say, okay, here's a four-year program. Get them, get it involved in something. And that's why we have offered a program. It's called Certified Production Technician. We didn't invent it. The National Association of Manufacturers did. It's a 10-week program, but it gets them involved. It's, it looks at uh, quality, production, measurement. It's just something that they can get involved and start training this. The challenge we have is a lot of our local manufacturers are not familiar with CPT because this was just identified about seven or eight years ago in the nation when our manufacturers said, well, maybe we, had, we should have some entry-level ubiquitous degree so somebody had a certification in Tulsa that could walk to Miami, Florida and understand you have those core competencies. I also think what it's trying to do is stretch that 14 to 24 more. What can we do as an EDC working with our partners in Career Source and our uh, partners in Ed, Eastern Florida who does the program and the training? How can we as a community create a workforce? And the beauty about manufacturing too is that it pays more. And I can show you charts and charts and charts where someone with a four-year degree in the next four to 10 years and someone with four years of experience and maybe a few certifications the person in the manufacturing the certification will make it probably 60% more. And I can show you those numbers. So if you ask me what's the greatest challenge, this is not a challenge just for Linda at the EDC or Lisa at the Career Source. It's a challenge for our community, and I don't mean to sound melodramatic, but quite frankly, it's a challenge for this nation. Because if we don't reclaim this onshoring that's occurring, this reshoring, it's occurring. But they're, they're mechanizing a lot of it too. So all of a sudden we're having this renaissance going on in manufacturing, we better have the workforce ready to go. So we're playing a role. Lisa has a program uh, called AIM uh, Advanced Manufacturing. It's a program of which we, with this little CPT program, will help maybe kind of create the feeder stock that will go into and then through the certifications, the advanced certification. The CPT is just an entry level. And I guess the analogy I could use because I'm saying a lot of time explaining that is if you want, um, you know, if you want nurses that, uh, uh, if you want a lot of nurses, maybe you can get 50 people becoming CNAs, maybe 25 of those will go on into the medical system, and more and more and more like that. So our goal is to get a lot of people considering getting into manufacturing. My goal is this. We get five years from now, three years from now, we are successful with the CPT and the AIM program, and we start having welders that can bring blueprints, because that's where our goal is, not the CPT. I will put an ad in the Wall Street Journal, and I will say we have 25 welders that could be blueprints looking for jobs. The companies will then come follow us. And especially in this environment now, a challenge of incentives, we have got to find another way to shark that advantage. Thank you, Linda. And Dave, how about you? What kind of challenges do you see the airport facing in the next couple of years? One well, of the biggest challenges that we see is, is, is bringing in more passengers. And then to bring in passengers, we have to give them a passenger experience. And that's both on the domestic side and, and also trying to bring in more international flights. Uh, besides passengers, the things that we're also looking at is the research and development side. Expanding the um, areas like uh, Grumman and Harris and, and then manufacturing with uh, Embraer. And then also uh, increasing the, uh, the technology side with uh, FIT and uh, uh, Eastern Florida State College. All right. I know that our time is going to run shorter than you think, so let me open it up to all of you out there. I have some more questions if we don't see hands going up, but, but let's see. Do we have any hands out there? Question for one of our panelists or more than one? Can't see with the bright lights. This is, must be what it's like to be like a star. Okay, I see one right over there. Thank you. Actually, I've got two questions. The first one is for Dr. Stackpole. Um, let me find my question here. Um, are you, do you foresee any new majors that students could uh, enroll in that would um, help them manage the transportation issues in the future? Well, we continue to look at areas where there's opportunity to make a difference educationally, and whether it's healthcare, whether it's STEM fields, we're big in the STEM areas, so any programs or any advances in those areas is extremely important to us, you know, including the areas of intellectual property. 
Um, and we're going to be very intentional as we explore this uh, in, in the educational standpoint, internationally and nationally, um, to, to increase that influence. Thank you. One more quick question for Ms. Weatherman. Um, do you also foresee any specific training needs that tackle just the transportation issues? Um, you know, our focus has been on manufacturing, but I would, there is a program that I've been intrigued with. I'm a big believer in tactics, doable deeds. I mean, we could say, let's take care of the manufacturing problems that we have, and you can't do that. So I'm leading up to this. There is an entry-level certification. I talked about this um, certified production technician. There's one called certified logistic technician, and that's something I wanted to share down the road with some of my um, partners as we start getting involved, especially with the cargo in the international airport, and that, that cargo starts building up. That might be something that we look at promoting more where we get people coming in to, to become experts and we become a center for logis logistics expertise. Okay, good. We have any questions? I think we had one over here. Over there? Okay, we have a question over there. Mike, come into you. Actually, I'm really loud. Okay, I'm good. Lisa <laughs> Rice with Career Source for BARD. And just to let you guys know, Eastern already has that transportation certification going. They're ahead of the game, guys. So we're good on your transportation stuff. So. And FIT has a master's in logistics, by the way. There you go. Okay, so we can start over here and, and end over there. And whoop, my, whoop. my son is oh. participating in that program, Yay. and he's thrilled to be participating. Um, I saw something about, I believe it was a $30 million fund uh, moving forward to Governor Scott to help. Uh, fund some of this education, is that true? Are they looking to put uh, a significant amount of money in for, I'm assuming, grants, uh, you know, some type of education systems to help move this manufacturing education along? Well, I can't, I can't speak for Eastern Florida, Eastern England, I don't know if you've got something involved in that, and uh, I think the school system too, I'm sure they always are competing because we're also competing against our other uh, universities too. Uh, we've put in and requested, because this funding program that we're talking about, the CCPT, has been really uh, funded by the, uh, a couple of companies and people literally writing checks because they believe in it. Um, we've gotten 60 students through and it's been nickel and diming for us to be able to get to that critical mass. We've requested some money. We're in it, but you know what happened last year, I mean, everybody was mad at the governor and they, he vetoed everything, so we're just, you know hoping that we don't get vetoed either. So right now, if we're able to do that, we'll not only be able to have money secured so we can feel confident in getting students in and through the program, because we're at the point where we're getting students, they said yes, and I go, right back at you. Luckily, I had to call them around Christmas time. People felt sorry for me. It was literally Christmas week, I was trying to get money for the classes. So now we have the ability to say, you want the classes? Great, I don't have the, the pressure and the, uh, uh, the concern of trying to find the money for the classes, and some students later on. We're also gonna have a small portion of that for an image and attraction program too, to do a little bit. We had a meeting with all our marketing people. There's a lot of smart, wonderful people in this county. And we brought them in the EDC in a committee. We said, tell us, you guys are smart. This is your expertise. What do you do? How can we make manufacturing attractive to an average person to consider that as a uh, um, as an employed uh, in, uh, career for them? And they brought us a lot of good ideas. Unfortunately, you know, we don't need money until maybe we get through this. So, okay. Do we have any other questions? How about something on this side? Here we go. Rusty said that he had an exciting announcement about uh, Brevard County or Melbourne. I'd like to hear what it is. Gosh, I couldn't have planted a better question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a drum roll? Yeah, drum roll. Well, let me lead into that because Brevard County is very important for our project. Um, uh, we uh, not only um, you know, aren't looking to build a train from Miami to Orlando and say that was great, isn't this? And we're done. Uh, we want to expand this. We want to expand the system. Uh, we would look to Jacksonville. We would look to Tampa, and we would look to infilling between Orlando and and Miami. And Brevard is a key location for a couple of reasons. Uh, great population. Uh, we have uh, Port Canaveral. We have a cruise business that goes out of there. Um, we have a great airport, Melbourne Airport. Orlando, Melbourne Airport, um, and, and we're, we're, we're going to make a big investment in Brevard County. For instance, we're going to create about, end of construction mostly, uh, 1,400 jobs as we start building in this area, uh, a lot of money in labor income, 
in federal and state and local taxes coming to the area, but also in terms of expansion, you know, Brevard County has been, we like to say, taken an enlightened approach with regard to all of North Florida and how uh, they view the future. Uh, and I will preface that by saying that every other high-speed rail project that has been discussed in this state for since 1985, when Governor Bob Graham created the Florida High-Speed Rail Commission, they talked about a high-speed rail system between Orlando and Miami. And where is that system going? Always up and down the turnpike or somewhere around there. Never a thought about Brevard County. Never a thought about Brevard County, just bypassing Brevard County. Uh, our system has a track that goes through this county. These towns along the East Coast were built around the Florida East Coast Railway. Um, so we're putting the transportation back in Brevard County. And probably uh, our first expansion in terms of stations will be in, in Brevard County. The, the, your, your, your TPO uh, has been studying, has been evaluating possible locations for a station in Brevard County for about six months or so. Port Canaveral very graciously helped fund that study. Uh, we thank them for that. Uh, I think today, you had a meeting, Bob, um, that uh, the TPO had a meeting uh, where they recommended several sites to the TPO board, uh, and uh, they ultimately decided to recommend to all of our floors, to the Brightline people, that that, would, that, uh, that we put a station somewhere in the northern part of the county, somewhere in the Cocoa area. They didn't say, you just need to put it here, but in the vicinity of Cocoa, around what we call the Cocoa Curve as we head toward West Orlando. Uh, so that was decided today. What's going to happen next? So all aboard Florida will take that information and we'll start doing our pre-development work. We've got a lot of, we need to look at the sites. We need to see what it offers us in terms of mo mobility around it, major commercial centers, residential centers, other transportation corridors, ingress and egress to the property. What are the development opportunities around the property? I told you this is a real estate business as well. So what are the development opportunities? Um, and uh, we'll look at that and then we'll do a ridership study and figure out uh, how many people might get on the train and get off in Brevard County. What time of day should we stop? And how many times a day should we stop? We're very excited about the prospects of Brevard County and look forward to working with the, with the whole county as we move forward on that. Thank you, Rose. Mm. We have one question over here, I think. Time for yes, I, more of a comment. Um, I'm Linda Miedemo from Eastern Florida State College. It's been said that it takes a whole village to raise a child. It takes a global village to turn around an economic engine. And that's what we're trying to do together. We do have a GIS program, Global Information Systems, that feeds into our transportation logistics to try and meet some of these needs. But we're not doing them in isolation. We're doing it in, cons in consultation and working closely with the EDC and with Career Source Brevard. And in addition to that, we're making inroads with talking with both FIT and UCF, where our students, when they finish, can go on and transition more readily. So it truly is a group that is working together to try and meet these needs. And I just want to thank everyone here for that partnership and let you know that we are participating very actively in trying to meet these needs. So if you have suggestions, give us a holler. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. See a hand anywhere? Okay. Seeing none, I, I personally am really excited because as a parent of uh, young adult children, I'm excited to know that our local colleges are offering programs because unlike a lot of my peers, I want my kids to stay around here. I want them to come back. I will always have extra room for them. And knowing that there's educational facilities that will keep them local, along with opportunities in various industries, including manufacturing, because not everybody is college bound, makes me extremely happy, knowing that if they decide to move a little bit south, I can still get there, even if they don't want me to. And finally, knowing that all of our, our venues for transportation are upgrading, so I don't have to go to a mall again. I could just head out to the airport to do my shopping. So I want to thank all of our panelists and all of their great ideas and spearheading them for us, and we look forward to hearing our second panel. So as I said, we're going to step down. Greg's going to come back up and tell you a little bit about upcoming ULI events, and we ask you to hold your seats because we're going to start again with our second panel. Thank you all.